So this is a crime that's it's hatred or even some sort of punishment or revenge. I think if this was a random attack out of the blue, there would have been a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, and no one heard a thing. You know, it is an area that throws up a few sort of organised crime type, mafia type killings. And I'm not suggesting this is one of those, but it is an intriguing line of inquiry. This is Andrew Rule with Life and Crimes. Today we have a special guest, Ron Idles, former homicide detective, still an investigator, still looking for the truth about crimes that probably keep him awake at night. Ron has done a wonderful series on Channel 7 called Homicide with Ron Idles. We've watched them with interest, but we have two more to come. One is the case of Gina Rosato, who was murdered in Melbourne in 1982. And the other one is the abduction and presumed murder of a little boy called Terry Floyd at Avoca near Maryborough in 1975. These are the sort of crimes that keep detectives awake at night. Ron, you worked on the Gina Rosato case. It's the one that's going to air this weekend on Sunday night. Tell us about how you first came to hear the name Gina Rosato. What does this case mean to you from the start? I was a young detective uh, at the Homicide Squad. It was the 16th of August, uh, 1982. I think it was around 3.30 in the afternoon. We received a phone call uh, at the office to say that the, the body of a female had been found uh, located on the side of the road at Summerton Road uh, in Summerton, which is the northern um, suburbs of uh, Melbourne. There was a gentleman who'd been riding his motorcycle along Summerton Road that time in 1982, Summerton Road was just a lane each way, uh, no houses there and just paddocks of long grass. I went with uh, Brian McCarthy, my senior sergeant, and some other yep. detectives and forensic team and we arrived at, uh, out at the scene and uh, what we saw was the body of a, uh, a naked lady, probably aged about uh, 48 years of age. Uh, she's lying face down, hands tied behind her back. Uh, bruising to her buttocks, uh, and then a massive um, cut to the throat. So her throat had been cut and basically uh, just about severed the head from the body. The first point to do in those things is um, obviously a visual examination, but it's about identification of who the person is. Back in 1982, we didn't have computers, so there was a radio call to uh, the missing persons unit at the time. And we just ask, are there any uh, records of uh, missing females that have gone missing in the last few days? Uh, and this is the description. And uh, a short time later, we got information that a lady by the name of uh, Gina Rosado had left her sister's restaurant in uh, Johnson Street, Fitzroy, in a taxi at about 1.30 a.m. on uh, Sunday, the 15th of August. And uh, she'd never been seen again. Um, so that was the start uh, of the investigation. Uh, so we identified her. Postmortem was conducted overnight and the cause of death was revealed to be well, probably a very brutal, vicious um, attack. But the cut to the throat had cut right through the windpipe, right into bone. So it was a, a horrific injury. Did you draw any conclusions from the extent of that injury about the motivation for it or the type of person who might have been able to do it. You probably didn't think it was a little old lady who, who did the murder. You would have drawn some conclusions about that for just looking at it or not? Yes, you know, like uh, looking at the body initially and there's no, cl no clothes there. She's totally naked. We knew that that wasn't the crime scene because the severity of the um, cut to the neck, we should have had a lot of blood there and we didn't. So we knew it wasn't the crime scene, but the other thing was there were belt marks across her buttocks. There were yeah. belt marks across her breasts and there were bruising to uh, her elbows. And you could actually see like the end of a buckle. So it was like a man's belt and you could yeah. see the shape of a buckle. To me, yeah. that indicated she, she may have been like tortured in some way. And more than likely she was naked when she was uh, belted with a belt. I 
think if she was fully clothed, you wouldn't have seen uh, the bruising as clear as what it was. So this is a crime that's really, it's hatred or even some sort of punishment or revenge. It's a, it doesn't seem to be an on-the-spur type of thing, does it? When you um, start to look at it, she was a single single mum. She'd separated from her husband. Um, her husband was living in uh, Italy. She lived with her 17-year-old son, uh, Mark. Saturday evenings was normally working at her sister Belinda's restaurant. It was a Spanish restaurant in Johnson Street where she made some extra money. And she always caught a taxi home around um, 12.30, quarter to one. Now, we know that she caught a taxi um, that night and Belinda had given her a glass dish, a trifle dish, which was um, half full of trifle. On, on the way home in the taxi, the taxi driver engaged in a conversation uh, with her, uh, thought, thought that she was reasonably attractive and actually asked her out, which she declined. Yep. And he, he dropped her home at about uh, 1.30 a.m. in uh, Rossmine Street, Thornbury. He watched her walk into the driveway. It was a block of units. And he watched her walk to the steps at the bottom. And at that stage, she goes up one flight of stairs. She's probably 15 metres uh, from the front door. That's the last known sighting of her. Now, the taxi driver came forward after the body was found and he said, well, I'm confident that I dropped that lady home and we established that was right. And then he had other taxi calls right up until 8 o'clock in the morning. So he was eliminated as being uh, possibly involved because he was alibied. And his alibis were good. Like there were several calls to different parts of the. He was suburbs. Saturday night, busy night in the taxi. So, yep. and we went back and met the people that he'd actually conveyed around yep. Melbourne. So, Mark, who was home at the time, he's seventeen. Um, he woke up on his account at about three thirty in the morning. He went in and checked, and Mum wasn't home. Um, so he rang his auntie uh, Belinda at the restaurant, and she said, "Well, Gina left in a taxi." And at about 6.30, Belinda rang Mark and Mark still said, well, she's not home. Uh, and then she was reported missing at the Fitzroy police station. So okay. the question is, that's always intrigued me, is that she's walking into a driveway. We know that she's 15 metres from the door of the flat, carrying a glass trifle dish. If she met someone at the stairwell who she didn't know, I would think there'd be a struggle and more than likely the first thing to go is the trifle dish. You'd think. We did a door knock and we canvassed the area. No one heard uh, anything at all. Then if it was someone that was waiting for her, who she knew, you would think that she would go upstairs, put the trifle dish in the fridge and say to Mark, well, I'm home uh, and I'm just going out uh, with someone. We uh, we didn't find uh, a trifle dish up upstairs. Um, then we started, I guess, to delve into... Uh, her life and uh, Mark Mark mentioned that the local butcher had uh, been coming around from time to time having a coffee. Uh, Mark actually didn't like it, so we thought, well, maybe uh, the local butcher um, could be responsible. We found him and identified him, and in the end we were satisfied what? through his alibi that it wasn't him. What was his alibi, by the way? He was home, and I think he was with his partner at the time or his wife. And we were, we were satisfied in the end that um, it just wasn't him. We're concerned, I think, that um, Mark may have had some involvement uh, because of a couple of comments that he made uh, when we went and saw him on the day after his mother was found. I spoke to him and he said to me, well, you know, Ron, I can't drive a car. <laughs> Yeah, because where, where she was found is twenty kilometres from her home. Address. Yeah, and half an hour drive, pretty well. And the other thing was, yeah. uh, my mother wasn't sexually assaulted, was she? Now, and he volunteered that without knowing. He made that as as if it was a statement of fact. Oh right. And of course, the post mortem was conducted, and she wasn't um, sexually assaulted. Right. So pr prior knowledge. In the end, uh, we took out a warrant and uh, we searched the flat where uh, both he and his mum had lived. Yeah. Uh, did a forensic examination looking to see if there was any blood cleaned up or anything like that or broken glass or even if we could find some clothing that she might have been wearing, but there was nothing uh, in the flat 
that indicated anything uh, had happened there. Um, then we found out that she'd been seeing another man. I believe he was Greek. His name was Max, and he was involved in the building industry. And she told Linda, her um, sister, that I've met this man. Uh, his name's Max. Indicated that she was going to have or was having a relationship with him. Now, there was lots of publicity around uh, Max, but uh, Max never, ever came forward. We never identified him. Uh, maybe Max was married. Did she also work at another cafe part-time in High Street around not far away? Predominantly, she did some extra work to support her, um, I suppose, government allowances. Uh, she was totally um, probably devoted to, to Mark and not overbearing, but uh, smothered him and right, never let yeah. him probably grow up. And to some extent, you know, another comment that he made, but you've got to take it into account, he's only 16 at the time and he was asked a question yeah. by one of the reporters when he did a media conference. And he said, oh, well, it'll probably take me six months to get over. Again, which is odd, but you don't know what his baseline is. The fact that she worked at another cafe, I mean, she's a gregarious, friendly, good-looking woman. She looked, according to those who knew her, she looked younger than her actual age. She would have met a lot of people because, you know, she worked waitressing and a lot of people go into cafes and drink coffee or whatever. Is it conceivable that she just pelled up with somebody at either of the restaurant or the cafe and that there could be an unknown man in this? It could be Max or it could be another one. Is that possible? It's possible it could be uh, anyone. Uh, But I would think that um, whoever it is uh, had to know what her movements were, uh, particularly on a Saturday evening. Now, whether that's as a result of her telling somebody or whether that's a result of someone watching her, she was always dressed immaculately, always had makeup on. But on this particular Saturday night when she went to her sister's restaurant, she didn't look well and Belinda said well what's wrong and she said oh I've got a migraine so she basically um, went upstairs but Belinda got the impression that that there was something uh, worrying her or troubling her or maybe it was just a migraine but Belinda says look she just didn't look herself uh, we were in the taxi and uh, away she went. She went out in the street from the restaurant and onto the corner where the taxi driver saw her in Nicholson Street and he picked her up in Nicholson Street, then did a U-turn and took her home. Is it conceivable she's put the trifle down to light a cigarette or something and left it, the way that I often leave things? Um, many of us do. If we're carrying two things, we forget the third thing. Is that possible? Highly unlikely, because I think did, the taxi driver would have said, well, by the way. In his statement, he doesn't mention the trifle dish, I notice. Now, is that because... He does not mention the trifle dish, but you would think that, that if... She left it on the floor of the taxi and the next passenger got in. They would say, yeah. well, hang on a minute. It's a trifle dish. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's a um, funny thing. But if she'd left it in Fitzroy, he would never have seen it because he doesn't mention it in his statement, does he? He says she was wearing a grey-green dress and she's carrying a bag, but he doesn't mention this woman who would be having to hold that in both hands, I would have thought, you know, a biggish glass dish. It's just a, f- a funny thing that he doesn't he doesn't mention it. But I suppose his mind might have been, he, I don't know, I suppose we all noticed different things and he didn't remember that. Was his statement taken fairly quickly or only a long time later? She was found on the Monday and I think yeah. um, he came forward uh, on the Tuesday. Oh, okay. So he, he actually came forward. So his statement would have been taken within two or three days. And he had no form for anything. He's dead now, as I understand it. He yes. had no form for anything. No. Just another taxi driver and, yeah, good on him. So is this, in your mind, a genuine mystery that's it's sort of a dollar thirty each of three? You know, there's there's a few possibilities. Obviously, you can't be too frank, I suppose. But There's several possibilities. Yeah. Uh, one might be Max. One might be that uh, Mark has said something to somebody. Uh, and for whatever reason, Mark has some knowledge, but I don't believe Mark is responsible. And I've said before, if someone was to ask me, point to the evidence that Mark is involved, I can't. There is none. He not only couldn't drive, and that's, you know, a lot of people who don't have licences can drive a bit, but he didn't own a car and neither did his mother. It would have to be someone that Mark knew. 
And then the other other possibility is just an unknown person who she's met who knew what her movements were. And who didn't shock her enough to drop the trifle dish outside, but it didn't get broken and didn't drop the trifle and therefore that clue goes away with her. She might have met someone. She might not have even gone upstairs. Someone yeah. she knew and they said, look, uh, why don't we just go to High Street and have a coffee? Oh, all right, yeah. just go to High Street. I'll leave the and, trifle dish in the car. And, and it's gone from there. Did you personally talk to the butcher? Yes. I'm not sure whether he's still with us or not, that man, but um, no, we're not identifying him. Uh, he was a butcher from somewhere in the northern suburbs. There were many of them. What was his demeanour? No, he was he was very relaxed. He admitted that um, he'd been visiting Gina. Uh, he didn't admit any relationship with her other than going there and um, talking to her and found her a, a good company. Yeah. According to Mark's cousin, uh, that is the niece of the dead woman, this is Marissa, she said he was the first person that the family rang and were interested in. They, they were worried about him. That doesn't mean anything, I guess, but he was the one they thought of first. And they said something about he said he was with his old mother that night. I no, can't recall, no. but we were, <laughs> bottom line was I think we were, we were all so satisfied so. that he, he was alibied and yep. he wasn't involved. And admittedly, like, we went to the butcher shop and I can remember walking in and going into the back room and you look at it and you think, well, she could have been tied up here with her hands above her head easily had a throat cut and everything's washed away. But she did have mud between her toes. So at some stage, while she's alive, she's standing up uh, in, in mud. mud. It really is a genuine mystery. And if it's anything to do with anybody that, that's close to home, they, that person would need help, which makes it even more mysterious. I think if you look at uh, the statistics, 98% of murders are committed by someone known to the victim. It's very, very rare that it's going to be uh, a random attack. I think if this was a random attack out of the blue, uh, there would have been a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, and no one heard a thing. And Carl Williams had a, a saying that those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know, but in the end, they all talk. So I would say that there's someone yeah. in the community who holds the key to this, who actually knows, yeah. and as a result of your podcast and the show on Sunday night, I'd urge those that have got any information to come forward and to yeah. contact Crime Stoppers. It's always been a, a fascinating case and a total mystery. This lady, Gina, her married name was Rosato. She came from an old established Italian family up in the Myrtleford area, the northeast, the tobacco country. Uh, and they had been around for a couple of generations. She was born in Australia and was relatively sort of Australianised, for want of a better phrase. But uh, she did come from that background, and it was a background that had its share of light and shade. I think her own brother-in-law had been murdered up there. Uh, I think it might be Belinda's first husband. The, the restaurant lady's first husband had been murdered, and there'd been other sad events in their lives, you know, deaths, uh, untimely deaths. And it is an area which has thrown up over the years some reasonably sinister things. We've got the disappearance of a woman called Kath Bergerman up at Chess Hunt in that area. And it seems clear that members of her family are under suspicion for her disappearance. And we've seen the case of Rocky Aria, one of the families from up there who was found buried in somebody else's grave uh, over near Shepparton at the Pine Lodge Cemetery. You know, it is an area that throws up a few sort of organised crime type, mafia type killings. And I'm not suggesting this is one of those, but it is an intriguing line of inquiry. Could uh, families be involved in old, bitter vendettas that end up festering and leading to this sort of thing? Is it a possibility? I don't think it's crazy. I think uh, it's a possibility. I think... Um the area of Myrtleford where the tobacco growing was and, and I think you're right, Belinda's first husband was murdered, which is Gina's um, brother-in-law. So there's issues around, and I'm not saying they're involved, but taxation, avoidance and all that. It could be just as simple as uh, Gina having some knowledge about something. I don't know. 
These stories get convoluted, as you know better than anybody. And, you know, rumour piles on top of gossip, which piles on top of bad memories and poor memories. But it was suggested, again, by the niece, who's very talkative, as you know, you, you gave me her phone number. She says that a policeman has told, or an ex-policeman has told her that a car seen hanging around this block of flats the week before this murder, the number plate was registered to Mario Condello, well-known northern suburban crook, violent man, thought he was a gangster and acted like a gangster, did bad things. Is it conceivable that someone like Mario Condello in the 80s was, you know, conducting simultaneous affairs with various people around town and that somehow that Gina could end up on the wrong end of that deal? Actually not aware of that. No, no worries. And for all I know, that's a complete furphy. But Marissa, the niece, apparently has been told that by someone that she thinks has information about, you know, she's probably been told a lot of things by a lot of people that don't add up to a hill of beans. It's hard to know. Ron, thanks for coming on and telling us more about the Gina Rosato case. I know that there's a lot more to be said about it and that you'll be saying it on your investigation program, which airs on Channel 7 tomorrow night. And we'll also talk to you again next week about another case entirely. Thanks, Andrew.